JP, I have to just say, I'm uh, guitar rock, whatever. We're not vibing with the guitar rock. I don't care what uh, Doogie is saying to you. I know he loves old school music. Maybe Noodles does, but I need something like, I need something grooving on the way in. And yeah. that wasn't it. Neither was the other. Whatever that other one was in the last well, segment. It's been a few misses today. It's been a few misses. I feel like that was for Noodles. And Noodles is joining us now here to start Hour 3 up on Overdrive. It's Mike DeStefano filling in for Hazy B. Got Frankie and O-Dog with us. And I believe that one was probably for the Noodler. I would wow. have to say. Roadhouse. Have you guys seen the new Road- Roadhouse movie? I heard it's I garbage, yet. Noodles. I haven't seen I a movie. Well, garbage. I mean, you got to take it with a grain of salt. Like, let's be honest. Like, the old Roadhouse was grizzled. There was bar fights and stuff. This is like MMA guys coming in, and uh, Conor McGregor's in there and stuff. It it is a little different. I enjoyed it, but it it's not it's not Roadhouse. It's not. You have to agree in all your movie watching over your career that. The sequel to Dumb and Dumber, which was Dumb and Dumberer, was the worst sequel of all time. The worst. The worst. There was two of them. There was two of them. There was there was one like Dumb and Dumber, and then there was Dumb and Dumber Two type of thing. Dumb and Dumber Two was the actual original cast where they just tried to fire up the same jokes and it just didn't land. The Dumb and Dumberer were just two like fill in Harry and Lloyd's that were awful. I crazy still think, that they would do that. <laughs> I still think the worst movie out there is two. There was one named Cabin Boy. It was 68 Cabin minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> Who the it's, hell was in Cabin Boy? Uh, you you would recognize his face. It's Woogie from Something About Mary, the guy who had the zit on his eye. That guy, Cabin Boy. And then the other one was Jack and Jill. Oh, with, Adam Sandler. With Adam Sandler. Oh, it's terrible. Uh, Pacino was in that one, too. Was in what? Jack and Jill? I'm pretty sure Pacino was in Jack and Jill as well, wasn't he? That must have been in his contract to just oh. like, you know, you, you hear stories of guys signing five picture deals. I remember Cuba Gooding Jr. signed like a five year de- five picture deal with like Disney and he was doing like snow, snow dogs. dogs and <laughs> I saw that in theaters and all back in like, the day. Oh my God. Like the guy went from literally playing radio and Jerry Maguire, you know, all of that to, to doing that type of stuff. Same thing. Cabin Boy. And Dumb and Dumber or whatever the hell that was, the two worst movies. Look at Cabin Boy, 68 Jeez. minutes long. Oh, boy. I don't even know what the hell it was. It was. What's the name of that guy? What's well, Doodles, when you go watch that, like, yeah. I mean, you got a lot of time to kill on the road, and you always have being a professional hockey player. Did I, my move was to walk out because I couldn't. Yeah. I, I'm just like this. This is a misfire. Did you just not walk out, or you stuck no. through that garbage? What I do is. You end up on your phone now, like you're texting and like you're not even paying. What it is, I used to go to movies. I don't go as much anymore just with kids and how busy I am and all that. But I used to go to movies to like just escape from life. I need a two hour break. And I I knew going in, hey, this movie's not going to win an Oscar. It is, you know, Steven Seagal, whatever, you know. And, and, And to me, it's like that's 90 minutes of just escape reality. And a lot of times... In those afternoons, you would have the quiz master calling you or whatever. You'd have to walk out and take calls anyways. So nowadays, if I was had to sit through Cabin Boy, I'd be on my phone scrolling through Instagram the whole time anyways. Like I, I've had a couple duds lately, but not to the point where I walk out. Like, oh, I could see you. Like, I enjoy the popcorn. So I'm eating popcorn. That's what I'm no, doing. I do, I too, but I'll take the popcorn with me. I'll take the Diet Coke. I'll take all of it. If it's <laughs> garbage, go. I'm going to it does, Have, you, I'm not have you guys it. done a drive-by yet? Like, you're driving by the movie theater. Maybe you're with your, with your wife, and you're like, should we pick up some popcorn on the oh, way I home? Do it all the I've, time. I've, no, yeah, Bobby McKenzie's son move. gets it delivered to his house. Yeah, you, you can get can it delivered it. to you. Yeah. Oh, you Uber can. Yeah, now Uber Eats Movie popcorn to your house. Sean McKenzie special. I did do it one time during the pandemic where I stopped off, had a hanker, and picked it up. But I... I legitimately. You grab some Skittles too, don't no, you? No, I didn't. Just the popcorn. Just the popcorn. Twizzlers. I didn't put no Maltesers in it or anything. Just the popcorn. Little extra butter. Butter in the middle. That's the pro move. Got to get the Dude, butter. Dude, that in the is middle. such a veteran move. Oh yeah. When you oh, say don't. When you say stop right there and butter <laughs> and then the rest of the bag filled yes. and then butter on top it's of that. It's too much, though. It's no, too it isn't, much. man. Because, there because are people... you get a little bit dry noodles and then you get halfway through, you're like. 
I just I, started the popcorn. It's a tasty I, little I treat. The, the problem is, though, you get somebody who's aggressive on that pump, and they just drench the thing. And now it's no – because you put your hand in, and you're just oh, yeah, drenched in on butter. Your jeans. Yeah, that's yeah and then before. you have to wipe your hands on your pants, yeah. and then you're a goon, basically. So I just – I get a little on top, and then you give the bag a shake, and it just kind of mixes through. That's the way I feel. I like my popcorn kind of light and fluffy, not drenched in butter. Do you own a popcorn machine at home, Noodles? I do. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, someone like yourself I, must have one. I, this is how big of an idiot I was years ago. Um, I had like a bachelor pad in my house in Edmonton, St. Albert, Alberta, and I had like my house was kind of laid out. You know, I had one bedroom upstairs and two downstairs, and it was like this wide open space in the basement where I had like a bar, a movie theater, and a gym. That was it. And the movie theater had like six lazy boys in in like a U shape. And then I ha- I went to a restaurant supplier and I bought one of those Cineplex like machines. I think it cost me like two grand. It was ridiculous. It was stupid of me, but. You could buy the packages of their, yeah. you know, the prepackaged, like with the oil on one side and the kernels on the other. So I, I do have a movie theater machine. We don't use it very much. Once in a while for a special occasion, I'll fire up a batch and then it'll stay in there for a couple of days. But for the most part, I will just order in from, from the experts, the Cineplex people or whatever, Landmark, wherever you pick your poison. Noodles, I know you were doing Ottawa last night, but yeah. I'm sure you caught the highlights of Toronto. Oh, I watched or the watched, game. Yeah. Out of the goals, like, where Oof. where were you? Like, if you could do a breakdown of Samsonov, I know you kind of – I always like to listen to you because sometimes I think garbage goals go in and you're like, that's a tough play. If you look, there's a distraction here, interference there. But the, there were some tough ones last night. There was like, three. What your asse- yeah. What, like, just three. what's your assessment of that, or is it like, did it get your attention? Would it be concerning? Is it a one-off? Just break it all down. I hope it's a one-off because there was there was a theme. It was going from right to left, and, and pucks were going through him and underneath him, which yeah. was weird. Like, that looked like a balance issue for me. Because you're right. I, I was unable to watch the game live, but, you know, that play underneath the body. Now, I, I know you're pushing, but that's a clear-sighted shot. And you're late on the play, and it goes through you. Like, but there was another one too. It was almost the exact same play, and it's it's like it, he moves his stick, and like it. I don't know how it made it through that. This goal, I don't know how it made it through. You look at his stick; it's not flush. It's actually pointed up, the blade of the stick, and it goes right through the pads. There was a three pack there I didn't love. Even the game winning goal, that's Edmondson. I don't, you know, like Edmondson didn't look very good on that play and he's cross checking instead of moving his feet. And, and, but it, it looked to me like Samsonov was trying to avoid contact on that play because he yeah. didn't like push into it. And it was a nice play. Who was that? He sure that scored that goal. Was that? It was Bratz. 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 Sorry, Jesper, Jesper Bratz steps yeah. in. It's a left handed shot step into the middle, but he goes, you know, across his body, fires it blocker side. And to me, it looked like Samsonov thought, okay, I'm either going to get hit or there's some form of con- – like he didn't push in – like he didn't move his blocker into it. He kind of like just allowed it to go blocker. I just – overall, I'm hoping it's a one-off because he just didn't look very comfortable mm-hmm. to me. He didn't look very good. And, so, you know, that's what it is. So, Noodles, like you were you were a goalie coach at one point. How hard would it be to go into a playoff series knowing that you probably have a guy that you want to start – but deciding with your head coach, like how long of a rope do we have here? At, at what point do we make a switch? Like what do we need to see? Like those conversations must be ongoing now when they start talking about their playoff plan. They are, but I think everything is instinct. You're going to yeah. know. We all know. You're watching the games. The players know. You're watching the games. I mean, look at Florida last year. You know, it was Alex Lyon down the stretch, got them going. And then he hit a wall, and they're like, hey, you know what? The hell with it. We're down 3 1. We got to go to Bob here. Like, you're going to be, there's going to be pressure points throughout the playoffs, whether it's earlier or later, where you're going to need, like, when you don't have Vasilevsky, when you don't have Shesterkin, Sorkin, you, you know, the, the Hellebuck, the ones that we talk about daily, when you don't have the eight, you're always going to be looking to the other guy. Now you you've got a scenario where you've got a you've got to figure out which guy and to your point Frankie the length of the rope because if it was in the regular season guy has a tough start you go with the next guy you, you know you go with the other guy 
In Boston, they can do that. That's a bona fide tandem. Now, Boston, I think they made a mistake last year because they played Allmark the first six games, and then it was like, okay, now we got to go to Swayman in game seven. To me, I think they should have gone back and forth because they'd done it all season long. Here, right now, you're preparing Samson off to be the starter game one, the way I see it. I, I don't know how you guys feel. I think that's yeah, fair to I say. Know. But the, the leash, Frankie, will be as long as you feel he's giving you a chance to win. And the other guy better be ready because it might be a two-goaltender series regardless. If it's in round one or they make it to round two, it might be – you might use both of them just based on it's a tandem. There's not a clear-cut one. Jamie, is there any chance the other guy could be Martin Jones? I mean, I'm not trying to, like, stir the pot, but I, I just look at him. He has the experience – he went in and saved their ass earlier in their season, and it was almost like, okay, thanks for saving our season. Now you're going to be cast off again, and you haven't seen the guy forever. Like, is he even an option because of his lack of playing? Is that why he wouldn't be an option? I think he's an option. Oh, and you make a great point. All Martin Jones has done in every situation he's been placed in. Think of him coming in cold off the bench a couple times this year yeah. where he's had yeah. to hold you know, had to hold the fort and done a really good job. Jamie, one- what I like about him and you talk about it often is I like his it's like that veteran demeanor and kind yeah. of quietness where it's like he's a big man and he has the experience. I don't know. I understand you, while the kid is the prospect and Samsonov, they're high in the ability. He was a first-round pick. But there's just yeah. something about Martin Jones where I'm like, I don't know. And I was just telling these guys, I got a lot of time on my hands because I get up at 4 in the morning. But I just sometimes start thinking, oh, maybe Martin Jones could be a guy. Well, but- well you've got to get him one of these next three games then. Like, I, I'm guessing if you think he could be an option, I guess you're giving one game to each goalie down the stretch with three left then? You might. I mean, I don't want – the problem is, is what type of message does that send? That's the only thing. If, if yeah, you that believe, gets goofy time when you do well, that. It does. You're right because it's like, hey, you know, I don't know. Give me an example of somebody who's been sitting on the sidelines for a while. And oh, but it's like a defenseman. If you're yeah, the extra Carter guy, Tim. well, exactly. If you're the extra guy, Jamie, right? You're the seventh or eighth guy, and all of a sudden the AHL team finished, and they're like, "No, we're actually going to bring up a guy from the minors. He's going to play." You've been sitting right. here all year, right? Hey, like, Frankie, just that happens a, a lot, though. A lot of times, it does. Well, it does. When we were you're playing. Right. It's like the fourth line tough guys come playoff time. That was a majority black aces. Like yep. that fighter Alonso. type guy was replaced yep. by a kid in the American League black ace, and it's like, sorry, you're not playing. There was a good well, article today uh, that Sean McIndoo, Down Goes Brown, yep. he wrote yep. it was like 16 different guys that you will see come playoff time, right? And it's like, you know, the veteran that you forgot was still playing, the rookie who came out of nowhere. Like there's all these different yeah. guys. There's there, there was one, it's like the tough guy who plays game one but then we, he takes a bad penalty, and we don't see him for the rest of the series. Like, could that be Ryan Reeves? Like, where does where does Ryan Reeves fit in when it comes to his spot in the lineup? I, I think Ryan Reeves starts game one, and I don't know after that. I think he plays four shifts, and how he plays and how it's received will dictate how long he plays. Because if it if it continues on that he brings an element that is very productive because when that fourth line was was playing well and he was moving his feet and looked good, he was contributing and he didn't look like he hurt the team and his toughness helps. The one thing I keep coming back to, and I don't know how you guys feel about this, but you know everyone's made so much about the Leafs' toughness and their added toughness. All they've done is become like other teams. They were the outlier. Right, like yeah. the, the Leafs in the going into the playoffs the last seven years, they were the outlier. They were the ones that were going to do it a certain way. Now what they've done is they are more like other teams, the way that they're built. Everybody's got, you know, size and and grittiness and length on the back end. What they've done is entered into the car, into that side and goes, okay, now we're going to play the way that it's laid out with the other fifteen teams. Now let's see if our top guys can can get that into it. That's the way I feel because there's there's nothing different when you lay these teams on top of each other. You, there's star power, there's some toughness, and then you've got you know grittiness and all of that type of stuff. But it's going to come down to goaltending, star power, you know, luck, special teams, like everything that comes into it. But the Leafs are just like other teams where in past years they weren't. They had Jerry Malgin instead of 
Ryan Reeves. Right. How much luck do you think the Leafs need, Jamie? I mean, they've got talented players, and it's not like they've been completely terrible in years past. But no, like, do they need a fluky over goal, overtime goal in the first round against Florida, and then that maybe could like the. Like, do you think puck luck's a factor, or sure. is it just you guys got to make your own luck and go out there and get it done? A little bit of both, but don't you guys think that you 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 make your own luck? But I think luck is health. I think luck is timing of things. You know, mm-hmm. we could be talking two weeks from now, and we're like, geez, I didn't like, you know, I, I didn't like Samsonov's three goals against last night. You know, like, man, Samsonov was a difference in that game last night, and in a good way. Like, a goaltender, uh, a, a lucky play, a, a, re- a star power, a star player that just goes, not on my watch, I'm scoring that goal instead of hitting a post. Or, you know, I think it, oh, the, the combination, the formula, if you look back on anybody who's won the cup, there's probably been, and the most famous one is the Chicago one with Taves having the meltdown against Detroit and, and Seabrook has to go into the penalty box and calm him down. Like that was, to me, that was the TSN turning point and Chicago never looked back after that. There's always, if you go back probably on Vegas's March last year, there was probably a time where they were up against it and they needed something and something bounced their way or uh, they got a big save or they got something. Because I, I, now I think about it, Vegas against Edmonton last year, Larry Brassois was playing. And I thought Edmonton was in pretty yeah. good shape. And then all of a sudden, Aid, you know, Brassois gets hurt and, and in comes Aiden Hill, who technically could have been fourth or fifth on your depth chart. And the guy was nails. Didn't Edmonton have a lead in every single one of those it, games, Jamie? did. Yeah, I, yeah. I believe so. Like, I, I'd have to go back and think. I just remember, you know, it was you were getting saves at one end, and then, you know, Stuart Skinner was having a rookie season, and he was getting beat. He got, the, the dagger was the Marcia So hat trick in the second period, I think, of game six, where that they just didn't, couldn't recover. And that was Edmonton as a team, but they didn't get the saves. They didn't play the way that they should have in the playoffs where things tightened up. Jamie, I'll ask you the same question I posed to Johnny. If Matthews gets 70, do you think it trumps what the other star players are doing? You know, I've been I've I got I got the email today for the ballots and it's been it's been kind of like on my mind. So I've been lucky because obviously I've been in the building with Matthew scoring in the last couple weeks. So I've seen him live. I watched McDavid live a couple times here in the last couple weeks. I saw Kucherov live last night. And 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 then I uh, I did a Colorado game in Ottawa, but I also that Saturday or whatever it was the other night where it was Matthew scores, then Kucherov got three assists, and then McDavid put or uh, McKinnon sorry put a clinic on that night and got a hat trick. It's messing with my mind because I I literally got a four pack here of like, and we could make a compelling argument for all four. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I don't think it's slam dunk. No, I think no, what I it is. I didn't say slam dunk. I said Trump the other four. Not I don't slam know dunk. if it trumps because last night I'm doing my notes and I'm Kucherov gets two assists. He's 53 points ahead of Braden Point, who's having an unbelievable who's season. A rock star. It, it, like so, you're going like I, I'm. I'm not lying, guys. I I I almost want, and we have to. You have to let this play out because you can tell 97 in in Edmonton. Is, is chomping at the bit to try and get back in there because he feels like he's dropped a fourth or fifth out of, because he's missed one game. Yeah. You know, like, it, and the other guys, and Kucherov gets two assists. Ma- uh, Matthews gets two goals. You know, McKinnon. McDavid, if you guys can imagine McDavid, like, kind of, people are talking about his season like it's meh. He's got 130 <laughs> points. It, it's Who, it, who it, says it like that, though? Who's the guy? I think he's down in Augusta right now. <laughs> who, like, he likes to say that. Well, listen, Brian. No, he, would Brian never, makes a, he would never disparage Connor McDavid. Like no, he that. likes he would Connor. Never make this. Yeah. But it, he he has it, called him the undisputed best player in the world. It, so it that's is. slander, Frankie. That's it is. But shot. It, <laughs> you know what it is, though? <laughs> There's a compelling argument. Um, you know, I, I come back to it. There's there's a, an award for all of them too, you know. There's the Art Ross, there's the Rocket, um, you know. Matthews might get sniff in the Selkie. Like there's some other. Like I think there's there's hardware for everybody, but 
I don't. If you look at that's the, the one, though, Jamie. Nobody wants a little side action. Yeah, you don't award. want the lady bang. You don't want the lady bang. You know, I, I get it. But my point being is there. There is an argument for everybody. And I, if you look at the spirit of most valuable player, you could go. McKinnon has just shot that team, and they've been you know rocketing around injuries and everything else. Kucherov, they had Matt Tompkins and Jerry Johansson in net for almost three months. Yeah. And, and Sergachev, which is, I don't know if you guys know this, Sergachev is skating. He skated yesterday morning, and the word in Tampa is that, like, you're going to see this guy in the playoffs. I, oh, we got to redo our lists because I, I don't, this Tampa team, I, I think people are sleeping on that. We had them at twelve the other day. I'm like, uh, it's this a scary guy, squad, right? Dude, now. they could act. So they could put their shoelaces at the top of the ceiling and wind up and absolutely boot someone right in the junk. Yeah, I'm telling you. I, I, I so, so uh, to answer your question, oh, it, it. How did you phrase it? You said uh, is a lock or no? What did you say? Like the Trump. seventy? No, I Trump said Trump the others. seventy goals trump what the other two or the other three superstar I, players I, are doing. I, I don't think it does in the spirit of the most valuable player, but it doesn't mean that I won't vote it. Like I, like I, I have to, you have to seriously look at everything. And, and that's what I'm struggling with because there's an argument. And how about the guys on the, what if Sid drags his team? Now Sid's not going to get it, but Sid could no. be a five, but yeah. now it's, now you're disrespecting Panarin. Now you're disrespecting Pasternak, like other players, Hellebuck, like that team just continues to Winnipeg just quietly do what they do and shut out teams and win. And so I, I don't know if it trumps. It's just a ridiculous number that, you know, 100 assists, a ridiculous number. And you're going to get two guys to do it. But Mc, it's not like McKinnon has 14 goals. I think he's got 51 and, you know, he might be the most rounded out of all of them when it comes to it as far as complete. But it, it, there's going to be a great argument, and there's going to be some people that struggle and lose sleep over it, including myself. This might be a, a silly question based on what we've been talking about, but, like, to your guys' knowledge, think back to how long you've been watching the game, is this going to be maybe, like, the most, I don't know, like, compelling week of regular season hockey that we've ever seen? Like, there's still so much up for grabs. There's so oh. much to watch for this week. I was talking to somebody about it last night because it was like, who are they playing? What, who's playing this? They, no idea. It could, could come down. So I do the last two games for Ottawa. It's in New York, the Rangers, and it's in Boston the next night. Those, both those teams, on paper, you should be like, okay, those are throwaway games because those teams are going to be resting. Boston's one point up in Florida. They might have to dress a full roster to go, hey, we want first – in their division right you know it, it, same thing with the rangers rangers are battling dallas for first in the league for the pitt, president's trophy. pitt and the islanders finished the season against each other on the last night of the league I, year. I, I think the league i mean behind closed doors and they probably shouldn't even be behind closed doors they're pumped about this think Absolutely. of the interest so else brother you've got you've got a race on the ice as far as teams and you've got a race for the the mecca of the trophy too, the heart trophy yeah. where it's a four or five, six pack that could legitimately win it. This, the interest in hockey should be at an all time high just for viewership in the next week. Uh, I mean, so now you take a look at the Western conference, right? The Edmonton Oilers yeah. are now pushing up onto the Vancouver Canucks. We were talking about it earlier and it wasn't a complete book on the Oilers at U.S. Thanksgiving. Like there was going to be some changes as far as the coach, the goaltender needed to play better. But Vancouver offensively hasn't scored at the rate that they were to start the season, although they're still a good defensive team. But now Edmonton has a chance to win that division. And that's that's a long road for them considering where they were at, at uh, you know, at the end of November. Yeah. I mean, Chuck Knobloch, he's got to be in there for – one of the coaches of the year. Gotta I mean, be Jamie. I, 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 the, the three, I don't know. I've been banding that around too. Rick Tockett has to be there. I think John Cooper's got to be there. Like I, I found a stat out yesterday from Dave Randorf. They have had eight Tampa's had eight players play their first NHL game this year. Like that is great. Like wow. that is, you got to coach the hell out eight of that players, team. eight players that have played like guys that have come up That's and like, lot, Hey, we man. got, that's that's a ton. What about the goalie 18? not being there for two months, three yeah. months? 
Goalie and it's struggling, there. like coming coming back from the surgery. He wasn't himself right away. No, no. It, it just yeah. – I, I mean, Coop, I think what happens is – and I actually said this, we were kind of teasing him yesterday. Like, I don't know if he's won it. Has he won it? I no, think I don't people think he just has. go. I think people just go, yeah, John Cooper is one of the best coaches in the game. But they, they look at it as like, oh, he's got a you know Stanley Cup winning team. He's got all that. But, like, if you look at the adversity he's had to deal with this year, this might be his best year as a coach. Like, yeah. so he has to be in that conversation. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of coaches out there that have to be, but I, I look at Edmonton's situation. I mean, they were 30th place at, what was it? New York, or at US American, Thanksgiving. Yeah, they were 30th. American Thanksgiving. Yeah. Like that is, that's a little jarring. Like it's jarring. Yeah. It, it is crazy. And now, now they've got five games and seven nights here too, to finish the season. So tonight, now some of them aren't, they've got Arizona twice, they've got San Jose, but they've got Vancouver tomorrow, and I can't remember who their last game is. Oh, it's Colorado, in Colorado. But, you know, overall, if they're trying, like I think they're trying to catch Vancouver because you want Nashville instead of L.A. You do? You want Nashville? Like, if I, if I, I don't know. Like, uh, do you want, okay, who would you rather have right now? Just on paper, not the way they're playing. If I'm would Edmonton? You, if I'm Edmonton, would you want I'm LA Nashville or would you Nashville? because of Leon Draisaitl alone? He absolutely <laughs> slaps them around. And it's like his yeah. his numbers. I was going to say that. Oh, his numbers against Nashville are gross, like yeah. embarrassingly gross. I don't know, but like Soros or Talbot. Like, who do you want to be shooting pucks on? I, I very know, but good counterpoint. It's, tells, a, it's a great counterpoint. But here's the thing: down the middle of the ice, if Pierre Luc Dubois, if and if and and Deno, and Kopitar, and Kempe, and Byfield. Like, that team, hey, you've got Dowdy. You've got, you know, that. Yeah. They've, they've That's got... fourth line center Dubois. You guys been seeing that? He's exactly. He's playing on the fourth line. But I don't think that's, I don't think that's, hey, we're really, really deep down the middle. I think that's, you're not playing to your capability, so you're going to play fourth line. I think that's an indictment on him. It is an indictment. I, there's no doubt about that, Frankie. I'm just saying on paper, I'm looking at L.A., and I think that team is, the way they're constructed, it should be very deep and very dangerous. Trevor Moore, guys like that, that, you know, we forget on that secondary Beatles, area. He has 30 goals this year. I saw last night, 30 goals, yeah. Trevor Moore. We should do, honestly, maybe next week or something, we should do uh, a segment where, I've did you it. know? Did you know? Like, did you know that this guy had 40 goals? Did you know that, <laughs> you know, like something like that? I was doing that last night with a buddy. I was literally just going through a bunch of stats. Here's one that's the opposite way for, are you kidding me? This guy's having that terrible of a season. How many goals do you think Johnny Goudreau has this year? Well, I, I, yeah, I was going to say 12. 11. Okay, yeah. Wow. 11 goals. He has as many goals as Connor Dewar, guys. Does Connor he have, Dewar. Does he, but what is his goals. points? Is he, is he 58 or 60 or something like, like 53. that? 53. He was in that, yeah, yeah. like 50s so range. I did a Columbus game a couple of weeks ago, and, and looking at that, like that is, he took 9.75. They're in Columbus. Check, it's please. been a grind. But, you know, that is, that's gone from. The one thing before we got to wrap, Jamie, uh, the, yeah. one, the league should look at, I think it would be more entertaining, more fan interest. Every team, and Noodles, you've talked about the, the e-bug, Etc. About the goalie stuff. Every yeah. team should get one hall pass where it's just we're we're <laughs> here's your money and get lost and it's nothing against the cap and it's just here's your here's your bag of money and get lost. Every I, team should get one a year. You, you know what? It it would be great. It's great for us to be great theater if you just yes hand, because hand you can get out one you can mulligan. Get mulligan, you get a bounce back. I don't care if there's eight years left on it. Here's the whole bag and take a hike. And it doesn't count against the cap. There's nothing. You don't have to worry about it. Every team gets one hall pass. You I think it. it would generate a tremendous amount of interest around the league. Well, they well, did what would happen? Coming yes. out of the, the lockout, didn't they? Back in was it eleven? Yeah, I think 12? they had a one or two buyout like period where you could just yeah. do, you could. I I think it would be good because what it would do is if somebody is not living up to their contract but still good player, you'd have the Vinny LeCavalier. Like you would have all of a sudden free agents. Those guys exactly. would be lining up. You'd have people so, drooling over Pierre Luc Dubois. Right. Exactly. You know, and, and somebody puts their arm up and goes, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll take you because it hasn't worked out here, here, or here. But I, I think it would be. It, you know, as, as Hayes always says, the, the, it's better the movement, you know, the, the water cooler fodder. So I don't know. I'm, I'm all over it. I'm for it. 
All right, Noodles. Appreciate you taking the time. I know you had a, 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 a oh, wacky gong day, show today, gong yeah. show with you at travel. And, I was John uh, Candy in planes, trains, and automobiles. I was, <laughs> at one point, I was going to take my shoes and socks off on the plane, but it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're happy you got home. You're able to join us for a little bit here. Yeah, uh, appreciate it. You'll be back on the show on Monday, I assume. Uh, See you, Jamie. No, I'm Thanks. in New York. Yeah, we'll chat later. Next See you, week. Noodles. All right. <laughs> there he goes. Jamie Noodles McLennan. All right. On the other side, Mark Sacchino joins we'll get back into the masters uh our uh, overdrive continues here on tsn 1050 and now on tsn2 the showground with jim richards pardon i don't know have your fun jp because it's over (laughs) <laughs> what is he doing? What's going on with the music here? I don't I don't know what we're doing here. JP, uh, hop on the, the mic music. and explain All right, yourself. This is a this is a quick quick notice that we apparently have music with voiceovers. That's why I was confused. I For don't... a second, I was like, wait, are we still in break? And then I didn't know what was going on there for a that's, second. That's what happens when you don't preview a song, assuming it's just going to be the song. Yeah. Can so I give you a little all, piece of advice? Me. JP, a little piece of advice. Just play the hits. Stick to the classics. Just play the hits, buddy. Play what? I, I got a song that I'm going to play in the next, in that the that next segment. That is such a classic line. It's, it's, it's for anybody. Yes. Know your role and play the hits. Play the hits. Always play the hits. We got... One of our best hits on the line right now. It's our guy, Mark Zucchino, TSN golf analyst for TSM. What's going on, Mark? Gents, how's it going? I love O-Dog almost dropped the people's champion on on the boys behind the glass there. Know your role. I thought he was going to say and shut your mouth, but he said to play the hits. I thought he was going to go total total rock, O-Dog. Zeke, what's the role down at Augusta? I saw your tweet where a scratch golfer couldn't break a hunch out there. Like, talk to me, you, Goose. Like, talk to me the- about what you're watching. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm working, but like, is it just? And I, I said it to Graham Delet where it's like it's freakishly crazy how it could be that wet on Wednesday and Thursday, and then it turns into an ice patch out there on the greens. Oh, uh, I mean, this course was. Firm, uh, when they first got on property on Monday, this place was about as quick as it's been in years on a Monday and Tuesday. The last few years on Monday and Tuesday, we all kind of looked at each other and went, hey, you know what, we're probably not going to get the Masters we want until the weekend. So even that moisture that we got uh, Thursday morning and overnight Wednesday into Thursday morning, the way they turn on that sub air system here and whatnot, we kind of knew they were going to have it where they wanted wanted it. But this wind yesterday afternoon and now even more so th- today i mean we're looking at 65 70 kilometer kilometer gusts i mean it's crazy there's sand blowing out of bunkers uh we've got players digging things out of their eyes uh, at one point gary woodland marked his golf ball and and the gust was so strong the ball rolled down 30 feet down the slope he had to go back pick it up remark his ball I mean, we're, we're about five miles per hour away today at points where they, you, you could have suggested and you could have built a case that they might have blown a horn. Like when you can no longer mark your ball and get that ball in a still position on certain uh, hole locations, I mean, you're now at the line where it's like, okay, guys, it's unplayable. We never got there, but we were very close, and that's why the carnage. I mean, the average score today is 75. I mean, these are the best in the world, and the course is playing a three over. So what's that mean for the projected cut line? Are we moving and shaking there? I know it was four earlier in the day. Is that looking like it's growing? Yeah, it looks like about an 89% chance right now from our gents at uh, Data Golf projecting five over, which will bring not that many more people into it the last time I looked. It really looks like the cut, the cut might – Ooh, maybe get about an extra five bodies or so. So it's not like we're going to get an extra 15, 16 bodies in with moving the number just one. Um, so it's not going to bring as many players in back into the picture as, as you might have thought. But, yeah, it's going to move. It's going to move in that direction. And you know who's thankful that it's moving in that direction? Rory McIlroy. Rory McIlroy was kind of playing most of the day at one under par, hanging on for dear life. And on the back nine, it has not been pretty for Rory. He's four over par now. Uh, oh for this tournament, and yeah, he's one shot in the cut line. So Zeke, that's guys, mystifying he, the way that guy golfs his ball. Like I thought, he would have won this tournament four times. Being having the ability to just launch three hundred and fifty yard draws around those corners, mm-hmm. it's shocking what he does on that track. So 
so you hit the nail on the head, oh, because I did a little piece this morning with Lindsay on our on our masters our early bonus coverage and and I'm trying to you know make sense as to why Rory McIlroy again now this is going to be ten tries at the career Grand Slam, and and more Masters than that. Uh, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I believe it's something like his sixteenth Masters in total. But ten in a row looking for a career Grand Slam. He doesn't bring that game that you're talking about here. In the last decade, he averages third at the end of the season and strokes gained off the tee. He's like one of the most dominant drivers of the golf ball in the world. And at times the number one driver of the golf ball in the world. And in this tournament, you know, he's coming into today. He was 14th in strokes gained off the tee. And that's in a small field. I did some math and projected that across a full field. That's like being 32nd in strokes gained off the tee at a weekly PGA tour event from a guy who lives in the top five. He's Zeke, is it possible that that was his collapse that started on 10 in the back nine where he had that lead? Like, could that do that much scar, like damage to him scar tissue wise? Like, you gotta think so. Yeah. There's, why not? There's no other way to explain game, it. Man. It's no, I, his superpowers are cracked here. Uh, too much pressure. Elephant in the room is too big. He's tried 19 different ways of preparing for this golf tournament. Can't seem to get it right. This week, he decided he was going to show up like later than normal. He showed up, showed up later on a Tuesday. That didn't work. He's come in early. It doesn't work. And you guys can relate it. You remember Jordan Spieth? He dominated in 2015. Then in 16, it looked like here he goes again. He's going to win another Masters. And it looked like Jordan Spieth for a while there was going to win this tournament every year. And then he had Choked that his collapse. guts out on 12. Right. Never been the same since, oh, to your point. These guys are humans. They carry scar tissue. And sometimes guys take experience and even bad ones and somehow turn it into learning experiences. But there are occasions where they don't turn them into learning experiences. And the wounds harden over and they carry scar tissue and they never get over it. And we know, historically speaking, the longer it goes, for someone trying to complete a career grand slam, the unlikeliness is of that occurring. It becomes almost an impossible feat. I wonder if we're entering that world of Rory McIlroy, and he hasn't won a major in 10 years, never mind a master. So I'm wondering how close we are to one of the best players in the world who wins everything but majors. I mean, at this point, is he going to win another major at all? Never mind the masters. With Mark Zucchino. Go ahead, Frankie. Well, how much scar tissue do you think John Rahm is building up today? He just made a birdie putt, but he's five over now on the tournament. Is he just a victim of the wind and the conditions out there? What has John Rahm's uh, tournament been like so far? Yeah, I think he there's there's probably two things going on with John. One of them I think is is fact based, and the other one's just a gut hunch I have, and just a feeling I have from being out on tour for the last 10 years, just hanging around these guys and walking with them a lot for doing PGA tour radio and PGA tour live. You're interacting with them quite a bit in a year. Uh, the first one, I think you're right. He's just, you know, he's playing golf at the hardest t- time of the day. They haven't played a lot of golf on live. The only real golf course they've played on live that would prep them for anything like this was last week in Miami. So I think a lot of these guys are probably a little rusty when it comes to conditions that are this extreme but I also think that part of John Rahm's, uh, I don't want to use the word soul, that's too extreme, but John Rahm played this game at a real fiery level. Like, I mean, it looked like John Rahm would have had that attitude, whether we were playing for $1 or whether we we're playing for $10 million. Like, John Rahm wanted to rip your heart out, step on it, and beat you. I mean, he is one of the most fiery competitors we've seen inside the ropes in quite some time. He's a Spaniard, you know, like... He's got that, that fiery blood that, that Seve had. And I think part of him is missing a little bit since he took the money and went to live. And I, I believe that he felt that there might have been an agreement in place already by now with the PGA Tour and Live Golf and that he could be back playing some of the tournaments that he wanted to play. He was very vocal about not being able to go to Torrey Pines this year, a place that was really special to him. He got engaged at Torrey Pines uh, to, to his wife. I mean, these are special spots for him and, and he understands the history of the game. And I'm wondering if it's wearing on him a little bit right now. That, that's just me vamping, looking for reasons other than the obvious, which are conditions that are brutal. 
Zeke, can Corey Connor shoot 66 tomorrow? <laughs> you know, the weather's going to be better. The course will be set up for it, and he's got great history here. Not too sure what happened in the middle of the round today. It really went off the tracks. But, hey, he's got great history here. He can. Sh- he's capable of shooting a low round out there. He'll be doing it from behind, so why not? That's the good news, is that the weather in front of us is not going to be a factor at all. We're looking at temperatures tomorrow in the mid-20s and much calmer winds. And then on Sunday, if the forecast is accurate, it's high 20s, even up, it could even get up to 30, 31 degrees Celsius, and the winds are going to be non-existent. We're talking 5, 10 kilometers at most, not even miles, kilometers. So the weekend scoring, if Augusta chooses to set up this golf course the way they usually have done in the past for Saturday moves, and an exciting nine holes uh, Sunday afternoon. You're right. Oh, those scores are out there. Cor- why not Corey to grab one of them? So, I mean, anybody right now, I think we have to respect who's at top, uh, who's at the top of this leaderboard. It is Scotty Scheffler. So you need to respect that name and likely what he's going to do. So because it's Scotty Scheffler, I won't go too far down this leaderboard, but I think anybody right now, that has an, uh, you know, one under or better is certainly still in this golf tournament. Anybody over par is going to have to do something very special tomorrow. All right, T. Well, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Appreciate you taking time to join us today. Enjoy the Masters, gents. Yes, sir. There he goes. Mark Zakina, our uh, Zakino, our TSN golf analyst. Looks like we've got two Canadians that are going to be making the cut here. If it does stay at plus five, we got Corey Connors at plus two. And uh, Adam Hadwinch is uh, four over. So well, I wish I had known Corey Connors was at plus two. I based my question on the idea of him being at minus two. He must have got his rear end kicked on the back nine mm. today. Yeah, it doesn't look great. Shot four over on the day. Uh, yeah, I think he ended up shooting three over in the back nine. So not great. Hopefully tomorrow. Tomorrow's a new day. Tomorrow's a new day for a lot of these guys. I mean, yeah. it, there's a three-way tie atop of the leaderboard. Scheffler just... Uh, like he just bogeyed. So it's six under for DeChambeau, Scheffler, and Max Homa, uh, Scheffler through 14. So he's still got a chance to, to regain that leaderboard at some point. All right. On the other side, I think I've got one more filter in the chamber. We'll get to our FanDuel best bets as well. Uh, coming up next on Overdrive. Today's best bets are powered by FanDuel. Make your picks and assemble a same game parlay in seconds on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Today, we're looking at the Jays taking on the Rockies down at the Dome. Like them on the run line, minus one and a half. Kevin Gosman, seven plus on the strikeouts. And then I like the Raptors to cover the number tonight. It's quite large at 14 and a half. So I think the Raps have a chance to at least keep it to within two touchdowns uh, tonight. So those are today's best bets powered by FanDuel. Download the FanDuel Sportsbook app today and find thousands of ways to play. Please play responsibly, 19 plus and physically located in Ontario. What do you think, boys? We got time for one more possible filter? Yep, let's do it. Fire it up. Go ahead. All right. I'm not sure if Joe got it in time, but if not, it's all good. I got it. Scheffler versus DeChambeau on Sunday would be an epic heel versus face style smacketh down Sunday afternoon. I would retweet this. I would like this and I would promo your account. I would push it towards stardom because if you're not going to get tiger versus Phil, which is like, it's kind of, I think it's kind of sad for golf fans to have the realization that those days are over. It's like Scotty Scheffler versus a villain like the Shambo is the new kind of norm for a rivalry and must see TV. And it compares nothing to what we used to watch with the red shirt on Sunday. It's not even in the same ballpark. Yeah. But if that's as good as it gets, I'm watching it if Larry Mize is in the final group on Sunday. So it really, like, it doesn't matter to me. But that would be, to see them go toe-to-toe on the back nine, let's say they go to the 10th tee, one one guy was one shot back, that would be fascinating for me to watch. That would be must-see TV. 
This is a must send. You must send this tweet, Al's brother, because think about what's at stake here. It's going to be the face of the PGA versus a very vocal, outspoken guy who has gone to live. And now, like, if DeChambeau wins at Augusta, I don't care about the other majors necessarily. Dude, like, this is the Frankie. This everybody is the big him. stage. This is the big one, man. Everyone's watching, and there's a lot of guys that have a snarl on for that guy. It would be very entertaining. All right, fellas. I might have to ship that one out onto the Twitterverse or Xverse. Send it now. Whatever we're calling it nowadays. I hope Tiger Woods hit that shot from the woods and hit somebody. I hope it hit Hayes. <laughs> like, I hope it was Hayes that got like just dummied on the crowd. Dude, I, that back would be material. Oh, yeah. He's got that a would goose be egg. Oh, nice yeah. Go- oh, that would yeah. make my day. You know that would ruin his trip so much, too. He's going to be I'm, – I'm curious if he's going to be miserable or so gleeful Always. on Monday. He can't, he can't come back from a trip without being miserable. But how can you be upset after leaving Augusta? It's, he just can't get the wheels back on the track. I think he he'll be a happy camper. Wheel. I think yeah. he will, especially if we get a big-time showdown Sunday night uh, that he could be in attendance for. I think we do. He'll be back, obviously, on, uh, on Monday, but that does it for us today. Frankie, solid stuff. O-Dog, Great seeing you, buddy. You did a great job as well. As Al's always. brother, it's been a great show. We're going to be back Monday at 4 p.m. We'll chat then.